winter is coming. Might just be the cold. Winter is coming! It's cold outside. You don't know cold. Winter is coming for him. It's either me or this cold, and it doesn't appear to be going anywhere. And winter is coming! You look cold, boy. It is a bit nippy. Winter is coming. Winter is coming. <laughs> That's cold. Winter is coming. Mm hmm. I'm cold. It's cold and it's wet. Winter is coming. You're crying because you're cold. You're a long way from home. Winter is coming. I imagine you might be rather cold. And winter is coming. No, that's all right. I'm fine. You're not. You're freezing. And with that, winter is here. Well, he's almost here. He's uh, in the green room. And of course, the winter that I'm referring to is the great Russ Winter of winterwatch.net. And uh, we're always happy, lucky to have him here on the final Friday of every month. Hey, stop that. My cat is becoming a reprobate. He, don't do that. Don't do that. There's a new cat on the scene outside. We're we're we're, we're going to work on adopting her this weekend, and I think he's trying in advance to assert his dominance. So, um, but that's a different story. Anyway, welcome to the Friday Forecast. And before we bring Russ on, I always want to give some love to our sponsor, which is True Hemp Science, and uh, I sing the praises of True Hemp Science daily. And there's a reason why I do it. It's because it improves the quality of my life. And that's uh, not just for me, but from other people who have had the opportunity to partake of the products and the, the variety of the products that are available. There's all kinds of different uses for them. We have topical, we have products for pets. Yes, pet sounds. You might need some pet sounds soon. Uh, we there's there's a really great aids for sleeping with the gummies, and of course I start my day off with the uh, moon dust, and there's all kinds of applications in between. So if you're interested in the organically sourced and processed products from True Hemp Science, go to truehempscience.com forward slash ref forward slash twenty three, and if you type in one five m at m i n s, it's fifteen mins. On your checkout, you're going to get a free product. And Chris is really generous when he includes some goodies. Uh, and if you don't order gummies, I'm sure he'll throw a couple in there just to get you uh, turned on by their by their uh, ability to help you sleep better. Anyway, that's all you got to do. True Hemp Science. Let's get into the show. Let's bring the man on himself all the way from the uh, Czech Republic. It is Mr. Russ Winter. Can always Hi, Russ. Adjust, uh, hey, Robert. I got to always adjust that that uh, view there. Yeah. Because I end up looking like this. Kilroy yeah. was here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We're dating ourselves a little uh, bit. but hard, yeah. for, <laughs> hard for me to multitask, too. <laughs> so this is – you and I didn't talk about this. Russ was hanging out ahead of time. But uh, and I and I know you know who this guy is, but uh, Billy Packer just passed away. Did you know that? Mm -mm. So Billy Packer was part of the announcing team of Al McGuire and Steve Jones. They always did the Final Four for the uh, NCAA. Oh right, right. Oh right. That really he really goes back. Yeah, and they, that trio was great. Like they were, the, and you yeah, can Billy, tell that Billy, Pack, Billy Packer really liked my dad. He was I, always singing the praises of my dad. My dad uh, kind of appreciated him. Yeah, well, Billy Packer knew basketball. I mean, that's that's why he was there. He, you know, he was a little arrogant, 
but he was one of these guys that knew a lot. And so coming from Billy Packer, that's probably some, some, uh, good praise for your father because he would, he, and Billy Packer wasn't known to dole out a lot of compliments either. He was kind of a sourpuss, right? So if your dad got some love from Billy Packer, that meant something. Yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. Those guys were great though. And Al McGuire was just this street dude from New York, wound up at Marquette, you know, started to recruit all these guys who were very kind of unmarquette like and won the championship with them. Anyway, we digress a little bit. And uh Russ is the um he's the dude at winterwatch. You know, I've never asked you this question about your website. Because it's a great website, it's updated frequently, deep catalog, a real treasure trove an archive of research uh, into areas that we like to talk about here. Um, Russ, how many people are involved in your website? It's got to be more than just you. No, well, it's just me now. It was originally I had a, uh, she goes under the name Torchy Blaine. Right. And uh, in the, she helped, she really designed the site and set it up and got it running and contributed with articles. Uh, but uh She's got she's got a, another life to live and she doesn't really have the time to devote to it. And so I've pretty much just taken it over myself. And plus, I'm you know, I have been sick. My health hasn't been very good. It's getting much better, I might add. I, I think I've turned the, the corner, as I was describing when we before I came on the air. But I just haven't been writing that much either. I haven't put the work into it. I try to get you know, I'll try to go write an article and have to go take a nap or did so the energy level is coming back maybe i'll start pounding off some new things but i went through a period of about two and a half years where i was just really prolific and torchy was also also writing some too so that's that's where you the bulk of the work was done close probably close to a thousand what i would call evergreen articles right those are those are the real uh nuggets of the website and if you're not familiar with the term evergreen. These are deep research pieces that will live on after the news date. Yeah, they're, right? they're timeless and not necessarily just current news. Right. So um I've noticed in the past that every now and then you've had a you've had a couple of people submit articles to Winter Watch. Are you still open to that or or is that just kind of yeah, I know, I know Giuseppe's uh wrote three articles during the COVID period. I've extended invitations for him to write more, but you know, he's got other things going on. So he hasn't really submitted any, if he wanted to submit another article, if you wanted to submit an article, you're welcome to. I might, I just, do, I might write, just do I would, that. I would definitely write, uh, put it up because I probably need some content now. That's what I'm thinking. So uh, if some people out there who have some research skills and some journal journalism skills, wanted to get in touch with you. Could they do that through your website if they wanted to submit something? Yeah, there's a contact uh, form Okay, by, so, by email. You know, this is one of these things where people say, well, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Well, if you're sitting on information or a story or you've got a good angle or a take, uh, put it together and send it off to somebody like yeah, we us. Might, we might edit it a little bit. I might edit it or send it to Torchy. She right. might edit it. Right. But this is, this, these are the opportunities we have. The power of broadcasting in the virtual press is ubiquitous now. And there, there, there are challenges, obviously. Uh, I had one of my channels shut down. I have two right. channels on YouTube, but I have one of my channels shut down this last week for something I don't even remember talking about in 2021. I mean, this is kind of the ridiculousness of it, but the tools are here. And even with the limitations uh, I think we should avail ourselves of them while we have them to the degree that we have them. Yeah. It's, so, hard, it's hard to get traction because, you know, for instance, on Twitter now, I think, I think Twitter is back to, to sort of shadow banning again. Oh, no, no doubt. No doubt. If it's been kind of following the traffic, it's yeah. all of a sudden, it's, it's kind of like they experimented with me. Let me get a little reach, just kind of started reaching some new people. And now I just kind of see, I put something over there. And maybe a hundred views, hundred and fifty, something like that. That's that's your echo chamber. It's going to be okay because Dave Rubin went to San Francisco to talk to Elon Musk, so everything's going to be okay. 
<laughs> what's he gonna what's he gonna talk to him about who knows where to get the best uh, you know corned beef and rye you know in san francisco i don't know right but he just he just had two tweets up on twitter uh and he was talking about how he went to go see elon musk they had a really good conversation I'm like okay great excellent um I don't know if you saw this and we didn't talk about this pre-show. I just want to bring it up a little bit because it kind of gets into, you know, what we're going to talk about today. Do you know who the comic Louis CK is? Do you know, do you know him? Yeah, he's pretty funny. He's a funny guy and he has some really interesting insights. He knows a lot about the revolutionary war. He knows a lot about the founding fathers. Louis very CK, sharp. To, yeah. Very sharp tongue yeah and so he was he was on joe rogan and he came out with this statement about immigration and and he said yeah they should just open the borders and let them all come in because it's messy and it's supposed to be messy and we can't get away with uh closing our borders and just living our lives uh with increased comfort from here on out. It's just, it's just not going to work. And when he said that, I was really surprised in a lot of ways, but then again, when you look at his background, I don't want to typecast people. I don't want to put him in a a lead line bucket, but Louis CK grew up in Mexico, right? So Mm -hmm. he has, he has Mexico in his rear view mirror. And the reason why he grew up in Mexico is because his father was a very interesting blend of Hungarian Jew and Mexican. And uh, he was born in Washington, D.C., not the father, but Louis C.K., and his mother's Irish Catholic. So they moved to Mexico. I think he came back just before the, uh, like, maybe eight or nine, uh, and then moved to the States, and his father and mother divorced. And But when you, th- and again, I don't want to put, it, I, I don't like putting people in buckets, but when you look at that combination, right he's got mexico in his rearview mirror and for all intents and purposes you know he's got a bit of the social justice dna in his background yeah it sounds like almost like a cosmopolitan it's, it's this co- cosmopolitan mentality they're really it's, brain those people are really brainwashed and i wouldn't say he's alone because you just kind of hear it you hear that a lot a lot among these celebrities like that I mean, how, yeah. how often does Joe Rogan get really get somebody on that's really kind of a stout nationalist? You know. Oh, I don't. Wants, I, I don't think wants they, to put you know and wants to protect borders and you know write something in the Constitution about you know like the Ukrainian Constitution and Article 16, the Ukrainian Constitutional Constitution says to protect the Ukrainian gene pool. Really, <laughs> that's a pretty strong statement. That's mm-hmm. nationalism. <laughs> That that is Azov Command right there. Wow, wow, that is a mind blower. If and most people who support Ukraine and think Ukraine is uh, the leading light of democracy in that part of the world against the evil empire, if they knew that, that would like, just like make their heads explode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I don't know when they wrote it into the Constitution, but it's there, still is, hasn't wow. been repealed. Interesting. Well, you know, the the whole Louis C.K. thing gets into this question of can you appreciate somebody's comedy and worldviews in other areas while being turned off by their politics? Yeah, I I think so. The term for it is called genetic fallacy or fallacy of origins. Right. And you hear hear it a lot. I hear hear it a lot. I'll put up some article that maybe on around the web and somebody will criticize me for running an article from such and such a source, even though the article itself had some good things to say. Well, that's called genetic fallacy. Just because somebody, you don't like somebody or somebody has a flaw in some area, that doesn't mean you dismiss everything they have to say. And that's a big failing. And a lot of people really on our, maybe our side of the, of the uh, aisle. Yeah, you, make, we, a, you make, a, make a really good point, right? Because we've been really cordoned off into these camps and there, there's an orthodoxy with the, with these camps. And uh, I think you bring up a great point. Can't, you know, and being able to take in other points of view that aren't always, you know, maybe they're, you know, 
five degrees of separation away and not one or two. Right. Well, I mean, yeah. we're going to be talking about Jack, you know, Jacques Attelay here, here later. Right. And I've in doing some research on him. The guy was pretty prophetic, had some pretty interesting things to say. I don't reject everything Jack that came out of Jack Adelaide's uh, mouth. I have problems with a lot of it, but not everything. Right. He brings up an interesting case where um, is he both the prophet and the engineer? Right. Yep. Does he does he know what's coming because he's working with other he, people? He seems to be a little too much into it. <laughs> the, the prophecies. He, I mean, he's just kind of like <laughs> one of these guys. You know, what's really weird. I, whenever I look at him and we'll, we'll get a dose of Jacques Attali a little bit later. But whenever I look at him, I can't help but think that somewhere along the way he's related to Bill Murray. Like he has a weird kind of Bill Murray look about him. You know, you'll, you'll see when we, when we plug him in there. Uh, I just keep seeing like old Bill Murray uh, in Jacques Attali's face, but I don't think they're related, at least not by by blood. All right, let's get into uh, the bulk of the show. And let me, uh, let me get into uh, some of the stuff we're talking about today. Uh, the first uh, the first article that you sent me, I just have to bring it up. It's right there. Um. This is you. You did this a, a while back. I think it was in the fall of uh, 2022. Plutocrat donors lead the campaign to legalize crimes. Let's talk about this. I'm going to bring it up on the screen. And, yeah, this uh, article was written uh, in 2016, and, and you and you and you rebooted it in 2020. Yeah, because it's so it's just so prophetic of what's happened. It just. <laughs> It revealed George Soros' schemes. Okay, let me give you the background. They had it's called the DC leaks. I think WikiLeaks or somebody got got a hold of a bunch of George Soros's inside information, revealed it, put it out there. You got you know kind of made the rounds a little bit in places like Reddit and maybe Reddit conspiracy theory and a few backwaters. It pretty much got squelched because the mainstream media wouldn't run it. But in, in it, uh, it just basically reveals a web of conspiracy reaching into a multitude of issues. You know, the Soros Open Society Foundation was just a giant slush fund, you know, to promote open borders, multiculturalism, globalism, Discordianism, put nationalism in the crosshair. In fact, George Soros himself was, was quoted as saying in, in the, at the uh, World Economic Forum in 2007, he told reporters, quote, America needs to go through a denazification process. And he professed that he saw himself as an Old Testament God. So here you go. These people were think they've got multitude of money, which gives them great power. And they're I think they're organized going back multiple generations. I think the I think the root of it is Roth, Rothschild. Right, and so it's right. a very, very deep uh, organization, and that's their philosophy. What I just said, they right. got to denazify everybody. So I'm on the right page here, right? This is the right article. Is that correct? Uh, the December sixth article, 2021. This is November eighth, 2022. This is the link you left me. Plutocrat donors lead the campaign. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm on the other. I'm on the DC leaks article. I'm sorry. Let me, that's okay. Uh, let me let me pull that up. Although that one looks really interesting too. All right, DC leaks. Yeah, it could be a good jump off point to do the other article. Here we go. This this is this is uh right here, December 6th. But those DC leaks went in hindsight, and particularly you know, knowing what we do today, know today about the George Floyd prop agiprop, uh the whole I think a lot of the hoaxes and frauds that are being run. Is part of this, you know, the Open Society Foundation and his and his ill kind of his associate associates, and so it's twenty five hundred pages of uh, leaks of his gulldudgery, and I have a chart there that shows his kind of organization, very very much a family business. What do you make of that? All of it. He's got a huge family apparatus. Apparatus. So so is um is is this the Open Society? in the center 
Well, George Soros in the center, and then the spinoff of that is all, are all these other elements, such as uh, uh, the well, Earth Institute you, and the yeah. Barack Obama campaign and the World Economic Forum. He's very big on that. His different family members are mentioned, the ones in brown there. It's crazy when you go into the Open Society Institute and then you see all the different foundations and orgs that are beneath that. And yes. it's like it you once you go into this world, it is like a, a Byzantine labyrinth of all these interconnected networks where they move money, uh, they 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 uh use the money to promote what you know what uh, Alinsky calls actions, right? So I mean you could spend a lot of time like getting into the blueprint of where the money goes with Soros. It's pretty, it's pretty wild. Well, it's, it's kind of interesting when you, when you go around Europe, you can see, I remember being up uh, in Berlin, seeing the open society Institute up there a building that they had just walking by it kind of in a prominent location on kind of a side street in uh, Krakow, Poland. I came across one Warsaw Prague. I don't even know where they are in Prague, but I know that they're, they, they were advertising for for uh, workers looking for people at one point. So the, the the whole Soros thing is is interesting as a character as well, right? I mean, to me, um, he almost feels like uh, the Mandarin, right? He he's like this figurehead, this front piece, and I always feel like there's like another hand behind George Soros um, that is making his lips move or making, you know what I mean? Because right. when you, when you look, when you look at the amount of money and wealth and everything that's been accru theoretically accrued and, and continues to be pumped through these orgs, like, where is it coming from? You know, I know that Soros supposedly gained the, uh, you know, the English market with Sterling and that's where he made his fortune. And okay. So he made a big killing at one point in time, but we never really hear about any of his commercial ventures. We never hear about any of those things when it comes to George Soros. Well, we, as you recall, he was involved with Madeleine Albright on some kind of a big uh, uh, project down in Africa for, I forget what it was that they flipped something for a bunch of money. So yeah, he's always flipping something. And, 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 and usually it's through other government connected apparatchiks. Like I, here, Madeline Albright. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I don't have the receipts on this, but my sense is, is that they use George Soros in all of these groups and organizations to launder money, right? Big, yeah. large chunks of money. And where that money comes from, God only knows. It could come from drugs. It could come from the Rothschilds. Who knows? But to now, me, it's probably come, now it's probably coming from the Ukrainian arms business. There you go. I mean, this to me is the perfect setup for a money laundering operation where they reinvest the laundered money into these orgs and these groups to hammer their social change programs. That's what I think is going on here. I think that pretty much nails it. I mean, look at some of the, you got the Clinton Global Initiative, uh, the, the Quantum Fund, the Center for American Progress. Okay, that's sort of a left wing outfit. Move on org. There you go. Uh, essentially the black, you know, Black Lives Matter, which wasn't that big of a thing when this chart was made, but that kind of spun up, spun off too. Right. So I mean, what he's what they're doing is just funding social justice warriors and a color revolution. The color revolution is really a big concept for them, and in, any country is uh, in the crosshairs on that. Right, absolutely. Uh, quite quite a few years ago, so I think it was around ninety ninety eight ninety nine. I started to make friends with a really uh, talented group of people who lived in New York. They're all from South Africa. And one of the guys, uh, rest in peace, Mark, uh, was really a character. He actually worked for Soros. 
And he told me, this was back in the 90s. He says, yeah, man, uh, George Soros wants to legalize marijuana. I said, really? He says, yeah, let's put in all this money into the legalization of marijuana. And like, look where we are now. It's like, you know, mission accomplished, right? So why well, did he the, want? The, yeah, the big the big thing that he focused on is fighting these inequities, right? Uh, people of color, particularly young women of color. So he's got a lot of it's sort of this, and he gets these big companies, other mega companies like Google, five million dollars uh, racial justice initiative. So if you if you look at this infestation of what we've seen in the last seven years since these leaks. This is where it came from because it's just filtering a lot of money into these subgroups and funds and these rapid response groups. And they have this color, uh, color of change group, which is a multi issue African American advocacy organization with 900,000 online members. I mean, that takes a lot of organization to get a million black, black Americans into a single umbrella. Absolutely. And then they they use that group to oust uh, Glenn Beck from CNN and God knows what else. So that's that's like a policy pressure group. Mm-hmm. And then they take over all the human resource departments around the around the country, corporations. I mean, the human resource departments have gotten to be strange birds. Oh, yeah. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, at one point in time, they had to have human resources to uh you know have a cya department for management right that was the cya for management and then that changed and uh the human resource department became uh weaponized right it became weaponized Mm -hmm. and it was manned or womaned in a lot of cases uh by people who were on the lookout for predation and equity inside the workplace and all it took was a minor infraction or a minor complaint and the next thing you know all of a sudden it's a big deal somebody's put on probation and then boom they're gone and yeah so human resources just like everything in our in our society seems to have been weaponized for one goal one end yeah they in the leaks they thought there's a lot about this fight against racism and hate mongering so the whole hate mongering thing which is really come to the front was spearheaded by a outfit called the Center for American Progress that's a progressive group America's Voice the Center for New Community all Soros organizations Southern Poverty Law Center he works closely with them National Council of La Raza which is a which is kind of a reverse racism group right very anti-white, a lot of anti-white stuff. Right, right. Yeah, it's interesting. The whole La Raza thing, the Reconquista. I mean, some of that is pretty real. But my experience living here in Texas uh, amongst a heavy uh, Mexican-American population is like, nah, we're good. <laughs> you know, we're good. We like it here. We enjoy working. We enjoy families. They're way more conservative. Um, that doesn't mean that they're, you know, that the entire uh, demographic is like that. But you won't find a. You may find some of it in Austin, but out here, nobody cares. No, nobody cares, right? Uh, the migrants, maybe first, second generation, they don't care, and the people that are are, are employing them working with them, living with them, having their kids go and play, you know, play together, go to school. They don't care. So that's a really interesting one. The whole La Raza thing. Um, I don't, in terms of starting a, a fire in that community, like they've started a fire in the black community, it's going to take a lot more than I think what we've seen to this point. Right. Yeah. Because a lot, it's like you say, a lot of us, the older generation, older generations came in the twenties, you know, there was a lot of them came through the during this revolution they had in the next 1920s when they persecuted a lot of Catholics. Right. I have an I have an article on that. I can't think of it on top of my mind. It was really a good article I wrote that talked about what drove a, the, a big wave of Mexican migration in the United States was persecution of the church by these Marxists. Uh, Damn, we should probably look that article up. What's it under? 
You want to get into that a little bit? Yeah, sure, sure. What's well, Freewheel? What, what's the title of it? Let me just look it up here. For Greater Glory, Mexico's Cristeros Resistance, August 12, 2021, For Greater Glory. See, these are the nuggets that you're going to find here. So yeah, this was, get a little this, education this was here. a big education for me too. When I did the research on this, they had a they had they had the Mexican Revolution in 1910, uh, in that was fought against the longtime autocrat Porfirio Diaz in favor of the mass of peasantry for land. However, later revolutionary leaders, now this is during the Bolshevik era. They were talking and make about. no mistake, this is where Trotsky winds up too. Roshkowski right. winds up. Yep. And so you had this guy named uh, Plutarco Talis, 1877 to 1945. So he ruled probably from, uh, you know, the 1920s, let's say. And he took a very radical anti Catholic stance, despite the church's strong support from the people. So he would cl uh, clear the, the teaching away from the church and kind of secularize everything. And the uh, Catholic Church formed a political party called the National, National Catholic Party that enjoyed good success at the ballot box. But the gangsters that ruled the country just, just uh, drove them underground. And eventually, they, there was a kind of a series of suppressions and ultimately a civil, literally a civil war that nobody really knows too much about. And that was, that was fought, uh, what was the year's Okay, when when Callis became president in 1924, he, uh, he Callis's Mexico has been characterized as an atheist state. His program is being one to eradicate religion in Mexico. He instituted a corrupt state-controlled labor union that ran the slave system and aggressively seized church property. Property, although more religiously inclined rural folks spearheaded the Cristeros movement, it also related to the official. A simulation secular policies of the Mexican state. Only lip service was given to the value of the country's ethnic, cultural, religious, and linguistic heritage as Mexico fell prey to Illuminism and compulsory collective universalistic philosophies. In other words, the opposite of Soros. Right. La, this, La, La Raza. And now, this, what, ha what happened when they fought this war? Uh, it drove a lot of people into, into the United States, particularly into California, and they were very conservative and very Catholic and very religious. And that's kind of, that kind of makes constitutes part of the Mexican American community. I mean, they're they're Americans at this stage, right? Right. They've this been, is they've been in the country for about a century, so it's just a different. They're Hispanics, of course. There's an awful lot of mixing going on too. Right. I so. You know, at the height of uh, uh, the masquerade, um, I had a conversation, I've talked about this before, with a guy who's Mexican, works at the auto parts store in town. And he helped me out with, um, I think I bought a battery or something, I forget. But he helped me out with the thing. It was the bigger bigger part than that. And we we went from him helping me out with the battery or the this part and just small talk to dropping into uh, the new world order and the surveillance slave system in about 30 seconds. It blew my mind. It blew my mind not that I could have that, that dialogue and that conversation that quickly. And the other part that blew my mind is that this guy was, you know, right there with it. And the thing that, he um what drove him to i think understand this is he had a family and he had kids he, he basically said over my dead body are they going to do this to my kids right so we're talking about a very family oriented community as well and when you get into those those family real values you look around and you see the threat out there it's like yeah i see what's coming and and i'm not going to deal with that right or i'm going to deal with it so i don't have to deal with that so it's a really interesting dynamic. And this guy is probably maybe second, maybe third generation. I'd say probably second generation. 
but um, it's very, very interesting. And yet it's another spoke on the wheel of Soros. And look, it goes all the way back to what they were doing in Mexico. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one of these families came up to California and my mom, my dad's uh, uh, sister married a guy from one of these families. So my, you know, my cousin is basically has a uh, Hispanic name. Kind of this mixed Scotch Irish uh, on the winter side with this uh, Mexican family. So you get into uh, the uh, Mexican Illuminous Jacobins. Very interesting. Supported by Kaya's central government. Let's talk more about the Mexican Illuminous Jacobins. <clears throat> well, Gal- Calus, 1926, I wrote that Callus was awarded the Medal of Merit from the head of Mexico's Scottish Rite of Freemasonry for his actions against the Catholics. God, they're, they've, they're always up to their eyeballs in this stuff, right? They are. Yeah. They... <laughs> They're, they're secularists. They just, you know, pound this religion out, out of people. Yeah, I mean, uh, clearly, clearly they're, they're of an infernal driving force behind the French Revolution. It's here, always- here's, a quote, here's, a, here's a private telegram to the, to the Mexican ambassador to France advising that the Catholic Church in Mexico is, quote, a political movement and must be eliminated in order to proceed with a socialist government free of religious hypnotism, which fools the people, Within one year, without the sacraments, the people will forget the faith. Now there must be a psychological revolution, Callus declared. We must penetrate and take hold of the minds of the children and the youth because they must belong to a revolution. Who's even heard of this guy? Plutarco? Plutarco. Plutarco. I love the name Plutarco. When when we started this conversation, I I had to go to my article to remember this guy's name. Everybody remembers the Bolsheviks. Right, Bolshevik characters, but not this guy. Wow! Uh, there's a really good movie that kind of gets into this. So, Very so emotional. they want they wanted to forbid the word "adios." Yeah, all kinds of stuff because that's that means God uh, if God wills. Right. Oh my God! They're going to find people. They're they're going to it's. <laughs> It's the for same, wearing, for wearing, it's the same place, a cleric, same place. wearing a clerical garb in public and outside church buildings earned a fine of 250 U.S. per a, a, a priest to criticize the government could be in prison for five years. But ultimately, they you know they had a pushback, kind of a revolution, and of course they really suppressed that. A lot of hangings, right. uh, a lot of burnings, burning of uh, Catholic, you know, dominated uh, regions and villages. Uh, and the Catholics were getting licked. And finally, the, there's this movie that, that came out. It's called, uh, the movie's called, God, this is a long article, Greater Glory. The movie Greater Glory. You can actually watch it. You can, you can look it up. I believe it's on YouTube and watch it. It's really a good m- movie because it gets into a lot of the martyrdom when the Catholics kind of reorganized against the uh, uh, secularists and fought back. But they kind of lost. They, they kind of lost, but then the secularists softened their stance because they, they cracked down so hard that they kind of started to moderate. And uh, even though they kind of excluded all religious doctrine, they kind of, the, there was a counter-terror organized against the secularist teachers by the Cristeros. It was calculated that approximately 300 rural teachers were murdered between 35 and 39. Many others had their ears cut off by the Cristeros. Uh, And so finally, 1940, uh, President Manuel Camacho uh, uh, repealed the American, the Mexican Constitution and basically uh, kind of restored the balance a little bit, let the church come back and play a a role in Mexican society. But during that uh, 15, 20 years, they drove a lot of Mexicans into the United States. There's a huge immigration wave of true refugees. Wow. This is really, really interesting. Um, Cause I, as you're, as you're, I'm trying to uh, get a little background on Plutarco while you're talking. And there seems to be during that time, also a currency change in Mexico and, and it's connected to this revolution. Um, I'm trying to see where I saw this here. 
Um, let's see where, oh yeah. So it says here, 1919, Kais traveled to Mexico City to take up the post of Secretary of Industry, Commerce and Labor in the government of President Venustiano Carranza. So you have Venus and Pluto in the same building, okay? Uh, the leader of the constitutional faction that had won the Mexican Revolution, Caius's position put him in charge of the Mexican economy, which had been devastated by the fighting during the Civil War. The two main sources of production, mining and agriculture, have been severely affected by the fighting. The key infrastructure of Mexican railways, which had linked many cities and production sites in Mexico to the national market into the United States, had been damaged. The national currency in Mexico had been replaced by paper money issued by revolutionary factions without uh, backing by specie. In his in response to this, many people used the more stable U.S. paper dollars. The lack of currency meant that in agriculture, there was no incentive to produce for the market, which led to food shortages. In addition, malnourished populations are more vulnerable to disease and Mexico suffered from the Spanish flu pandemic. Caius gained political experience in the months serving in Carranza's government and his attempt to settle a labor dispute in Orizaba in, uh, to support the workers there. So he's also involved in kind of a weird like currency change uh, where it, everything's destabilized. The dollar is kind of making an inroad. This this guy has a major uh, footprint in the history of Mexico. I was I wasn't even aware of him. Yeah, bad, you know, bad guy. Yeah, they reduced the they reduced the priest by about ninety five percent. So how does this all end for him? Uh, I think uh, he he just quietly left office. I mean, he kind of ran out of string, and uh, they brought in a replacement. And I think he probably just ended up dying in his sleep. Wow, one of those kind of guys. Wow. So he. It's really interesting, right? Because the playbook doesn't really seem to change. The playbook seems to be just kind of updated along the way, right? You you go back and you look at the, the French Revolution and um, the Jacobins, the, the Montagnards, uh, what do they do? Well, they're burning books and they, they're, they're doing everything in their power to divest France of the church. They're all the, the the heads are Freemasonic, right? And that's what they want to do. They want to burn it down. They want to burn it down here, uh, and look where we are now. The playbook just keeps getting updated. And yep. But by, by the yep. time, that, we're and that's what Soros is all about. That's right. Yep. Yeah. You know. So yeah, it's it's almost like a Freemasonic uh, or Masonic uh, anti. Anti-religion plays a big role into it, but now they've kind of morphed into you know, religion. In some ways, it's got has kind of faded on its own, and so they have to kind of morph it into attacking uh, the, uh, the the nation state and turning it cosmopolitan, turning right. everybody into that comic has that idea like ideas like that. Right. Yep. Let's go back here. Um, here we go. Going back to Soros. All right. Is there anything else in here that we can mine? Well, I, I think we could look at sort of the Soros uh, plutocrat donor leads the campaign to legalize crimes. That's that's another element. Anarchy and legalizing crimes. Right. Let me see. Where are we here? Money and politics. So, and so all of a sudden you got like the Seattle City Council all of a sudden changes its criminal code. Oh, that's the one we were at, that's the one we were at before. Yeah, we yeah. could just dive into that because we've got the background of, of sort of who's pushing this stuff. That's right. what everybody's got to realize. This is being pushed. This isn't just organic. It's just all of a sudden some people get on the city council and, oh, let's change the criminal code and just kind of turn that city into a shit storm. Right. They're downstream from uh, the Central Committee, really, is what they are. Yeah. So the proposal was called, the, the, the they always name it stuff like the Poverty Defense Fund. Right. It essentially makes the following crimes legal, squatting on private property, theft of a business, car prowling, stalking, trans, trespassing, assault, 
you know, more than just a few little nu nuisance crimes or broken window type crimes, really some serious crimes. So the yeah. defendant only needs to cl claim they are poor. I misspelled that there, <laughs> typo. <laughs> claim they are poor or addicted or act deranged in order to have a judge excuse and, and dismiss all misdemeanor crimes. Yep, yep. There was a film that made the rounds, I think around 2019, Seattle is dying. You ever see that Seattle documentary? Dying, right. Oh my God. I mean, but it all it all kind of started with this sort of uh, decriminalization or de legalizing crimes. It's not decriminalizing; it's legalizing crimes. That's the correct way to put it. Got to right. make sure we use the right language there. Right, right. So homicides and, have more than doubled, uh, and then of course the other element of this is letting people out of jail or prison, clearing the right. clearing the decks, turning them loose on the street. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, what's interesting too, is that the legalization of crime, I think goes in hand in glove with Soros's initiative to, uh, legalize cannabis. And, but well, of course, if you legalize cannabis and you can't jail people, I don't think people should be jailed for it anyway. That's my, that's my two cents. But once you open that door, it's a gateway to other legalization. And now you're legalizing hard drugs, but really hard drugs where, where people have a very difficult time getting off of them. And then they become a blight um, on other people's lives and society. So, you know, was George Soros really looking out for humanity's best interests when he said, oh, yeah, let's let's legalize, let's legalize weed. It's really just a stepping stone to promote this other wave of legalizing drugs in general, which, you know, as a libertarian, sometimes you look at it and go, okay, well, if they want to ruin their own lives, let them ruin it. Right. Yeah, but but it never it undermines the community. It That's never the happens in a, it never happens in a vacuum though. That's right. Yeah. Never happens in a vacuum. Um, so then you had this racial Rachel Rollins who ran for city district attorney in Boston. She hinted that she would refuse to prosecute entire categories of crimes the Rachel Rollins policy mem memo lists 15 crimes for which the default is declined pr prosecution. I mean, look at Chicago. They just go in and I mean, all these cities, oh. they just go in and shoplift like crazy. I mean, that's the big thing. And that's turned it. I, I was reading where Target had some, ah, it's just a huge amount of money that had been lost to shoplifting in their last fiscal year. So, the, the, and this leads into, like the videotaping of smash and grabs and having them go viral on TikTok, right? Mm -hmm. Like those are promotional materials. Those are promotional yeah. materials. And TikTok, of course, if they wanted to, they control the algorithm. If TikTok wanted to, they say, no, we're not going to. They're not, gonna, they're not gonna only look. promotional materials, but they're literally training materials. Right. And so this happens now. So everybody's, you know, looking around. Oh, look what these guys are getting away with. Oh, how did they do it? Let's let's move forward with it. Meanwhile, on the other side of this, people like Rachel Rollins and Chase Boudin, who is no longer in power, but we'll talk about him in a little bit. They tie the hands of the people, whether they're, you know, cops or people that want to protect their property rights. They tie their hands, and they enable the other side to do whatever they want without any punitive measures. This, this is really, man, this is bad stuff. Really bad stuff. Are you muted? You might've muted Russ. No, I'm just kind of adjusting stuff a little bit. Kind of. So these are her 15 right here. And did, did this get passed through? Is this really the, lay the land now well she'd be yeah that was her policy when the, the time that she's there i don't know it, i don't know to what degree this is still going on but th this has been pretty much instituted in a lot of these cities uh you know san francisco a lot you know gas gun set los angeles uh baltimore did it and it's just turned these places into cesspools 
I remember when the whole Freddie Gray thing happened in Baltimore and they were fanning the flames of outrage and there were fights um, outside of the uh, ballpark. The Orioles were playing. People were coming out, getting into fights with um, the protesters. And the mayor and the DA of uh, Baltimore basically said, yeah, we decided to let them riot so they could blow off a little steam. They, that's really what yeah. what they said, right? Yeah, it's, it's you know, we decided that'd be the better. Well, option. they did. They basically, they basically turned. Uh, they've gotten the blacks, certain blacks anyway, very very angry at whites. There's a. I I think there's a definite anti-white movement afoot in oh, those. No, da- no in, doubt. Part at least part of those communities. Oh. And Giuseppe and I did a a, a, a show that you can find in my podcast. And we actually went through some clips because it's very, very real salts on people. I mean, if you enter, if you enter an elevator with the uh, young blacks, you're taking a big chance. I hate, I'm just going to just get, give it to you straight. And we just went through clip after clip after clip of people, you know, whites being assaulted in parking lots and gas stations trying to enter 7-Eleven being salted by 10 black youth. You, people need to use situational awareness, right? You just got to use situational awareness. And we hate the stereotype, right? We, we always want to have that piece of ourselves where there's always going to be the thing that doesn't cohere to the stereotype. But what we're seeing now is really unprecedented and it's being promoted. And, and it's, and it's again, better to, and it's better to be safe than sorry. You it's, know, it, it, yeah. it, 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 to be a little bit offensive to possibly save your life or save yourself from serious in, injury. Yeah. And maybe not get into that elevator if you don't know these people. Yeah. It's, uh, become, very, it's become very racial. It's just hard to deny. The evidence is overwhelming. Look, I, I think that elevator ride looks a lot different 10 or 15 years ago. Right, the social well, contract. You got, plus, you got these prosecutors who are probably not even prosecuting no, some no, of these assaults. No. The social contract is broken. Okay, it's broken. And 15 years ago, <laughs> that elevator ride is a different experience because there's no broken social contract. Now there is, and unfortunate, but it's true. Right, it's it, and it, it on the other side. You have people like Jason Whitlock um, and the Fearless Crew. There's a lot of, and I'm going to use the word black men. There are a lot of black men that are waking up and they're yeah, seeing. And, disavow- and disavowing this stuff, right? Absolutely, That's- because they're seeing what's happening. They're being played by the, you know, the neoliberal establishment media and they and they don't like it. It's like, oh, here we go again. It's another form of exploitation, right? And we're not into it. We're, we're just not into it. So they're, now they're being lumped into this camp around being misogynistic, right? And to bring it into the conversation that we're talking about with religion, Tony Dungy, who's a longtime coach, the only black coach to be in the NFL Hall of Fame, went to uh, a pro-life gathering. And man, like, you know, black Twitter went after Tony Junji, right? This is the same playbook, right? We're going to go after somebody who has religious faith, beliefs, and values. And they savage the guy, just totally savage the guy. Yeah, well, they just, let's just bring in Plutarco uh, Callus to run the country. Well, that's, <laughs> we might get our chance. They, they pretty much have, I think, in a lot, with, in lot, we, lot, lot of areas. With your, your Uranus Harris. We might have that chance with Uranus Harris. Um yeah, I mean, so Russ and I, we want to be, I want to be clear. And I think you're in the same camp, right? Like we're, we're really looking at our situation with clarity. And if you don't look at the situation with clarity, uh, you're going to be in a situation where, where you wish you had. So we're not here to dismiss anybody, but man, you know, the, the, the videotape doesn't lie. Right. So that's that's kind of the state of where we are with a lot of, you know, real quick, Russ, uh, and we can continue to go through this because it's going to touch in when we get to the chase of Boudin point about San Francisco. I did a show on my channel yesterday uh, about Angela Davis. 
And so I did my little deep dive on Angela Davis. And when I looked at Angela Davis and her role in, you know, lighting this fire, because she was one of the fire starters back in the, back in the 60s and the 70s, it's amazing how every step along her path, she was enabled, right? If she was in trouble, people bailed her out with big money. Um, if she had a, 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 a dispute teaching at a college, another college would hire her. And this is a woman who was the vice president twice candidate for CPUSA, uh, trained in Moscow, trained in East Germany. And at no point did anybody ever say, we should kick her out of the country. This person is bad news. You know, maybe they talked about it, but at, at, not at any point did that ever happen. And so when you look at somebody like Angela Davis, who she was on the cover of Time Magazine, Woman of the Year, this tells you how long we've been dealing with this and how long these people have really been in power. And now they're just taken off the mask. That's what's happening. They're taken off the mask. Yeah, we're yeah because they're in power. You know, That's right. this, we're going to, you know, we were going to talk a little bit about this Project Veritas guy. And I just kind of made a comment on this so called director, the Pfizer guy that they kind of caught red handed making these yep. statements. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I just how, how did that guy even get his positions? I mean, well, he's just like a, he's, a, he's just like a cutout for the kind of people we're talking about. Well, I, I think he's probably bright. That was the thing I took took away from that. We'll play the video. I think he's bright. And there's parts of the video where he's kind of catching. He's thinking, am I divulging something to somebody who's trying to entrap me? That's somebody who has some intelligence to be able to think about that in that context. Yeah, but he was on a date. You know, there's a, a honeypot situation. Right. But he talks about it, though. Why are you asking me so many questions? Right. It's not this guy's not but jokingly. <laughs> And then he just goes ahead and just blabs, blabs it all out. Okay, let's let's save it for the video. Okay. But I, I, I didn't want to talk about uh, Chase Boudon, who's no longer the district attorney of San Francisco, by the way. So Chase Boudon had never served in any public capacity at all. And he ran for DA in San Francisco. San Francisco's elections are always shady. Uh, his claim to fame was he was raised by Bill Ayers and his parents are still in prison because, well, you know, they happened to uh, set off an explosive device in a federal building and kill people. Gee, imagine that. Uh, and then his other claim to fame is that um, he spent time in Venezuela helping Hugo Chavez with his letters. Right. So this guy got elected. DA, first thing he does is just completely you know, upturn the apple cart institutes this policy where if you steal less than a thousand dollars from a Walgreens, you're just going to get a ticket. Well, guess what happened? <laughs> guess what happened? These people who he turned loose on the streets of San Francisco started to get very aggressive with the Chinese community. And the Chinese community is very powerful in San Francisco and they didn't like it. And um, they basically led a campaign to get his ass out, right? So it's interesting that even with somebody like Boudin, who has all these uh, communist bona fides and is playing along with the Soros program and script, because he's a Soros guy, <clears throat> that when it came to crossing the wrong cross-section of the demographic who has very deep pockets and very deep political power, even he couldn't withstand that. Well, the, th the thing that gets these guys elected, these pr these prosecutor elections are sort of under the radar. Yeah. So a guy like Soros and his friends, and I kind of mentioned some of his 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 colleagues and these campaigns. George <laughs> Gascon. Take this George yeah. Gaskin guy in yeah. in L.A. Who came from, San, came from San Francisco? He was he came out of San Francisco. So yeah. yeah. Was 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 he in L.A. or San Francisco? No, no, he he was elected in L.A. But he comes out of the San Francisco gotcha. miasma, right. yeah. Right, he but heavily backed by George Soros, money. That's the that's the key, and it doesn't take a lot of money to win these elections. And no. the thing that what's ironic is he defeated a very solid district attorney incumbent named Jackie Lacey, 
who's a black woman, but she was she was a good DA. So they got rid of a perfectly adequate or better than adequate DA with a lot of experience running that department in a tough city and put this guy in there. So if you're not on board with this uh, discordianism, they'll take you out. It didn't matter what color you are. Uh, that's a really good point. Very, very good point. And uh, yeah, so we can look around and we can see, you know, th these people are, you know, they're either uh, DAs or judges, uh, they're mayors, they're on, they're on city council, uh, they're on school boards, right? They, this is where the infestation takes place. And it doesn't they, take that much money to get somebody elected in these spots. Not, 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 not in the city council, not nope. in the city council, not in the school board. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So the other, the other ally of Soros is Dustin uh, Muskovitz. So you know, you probably most people haven't even heard of these guys. It's like the Facebook co-founder that kind of took all of his loot and money and went away and just became a quote unquote philanthropist working with George Soros. Right. And they funnel the money to their wives a lot of time. Her name That's was Carrie Tuna. Carrie Tuna. <laughs> Tuna. <laughs> and they set this foundation called the Open Philanthropy Project provided significant funding for organizations like the Accountable Justice Action Fund, Fair and Just Prosecutions, the Real Just PAC, all of which indirectly or directly support rogue prosecutors and fifth columnist candidates around the United States and, and a whole slew of offices. The Muscovitz tuna uh, philanthropy is vast, may even rival Soros. Yeah, I remember reading up on uh, these two, and, and uh, they do all of it very discreetly, right? Like just kind of in the shadows. Mm -hmm. through, and through the wives, as does uh, plutocrats like Zuckerberg. And, you know, Zuckerberg is a real, really a plutocrat because he, I mean, people don't really realize to what extent he tried to influence the 2020 election. Yeah on election so-called election reform stacking the decks cheating yep yep so that's facebook the you know the facebook fortunes these two guys read so, hastings netflix so, so just to be clear for the youtube algorithm like it came out that mark zuckerberg invested heavily in the 2020 election it's not anything that's a conspiracy or there were making up Right, it's on the public record, so let's be clear about that. And not and not so much necessarily for candidates as for the process that got established of mail-in ballots and you know, a whole slew of things. So uh, yeah, this goes way back. Uh, I've done a huge deep dive on uh, Kamala Harris and how she got there. In her case, it 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 was the. Uh, uh, the uh, Pacific Heights crowd that really got behind her and funded her in a very big way. Uh, Cause she was, she would go to all these parties. She was always being tagged uh, on the socialite pages in the Chronicle. Uh, she was always being kind of hard to imagine people. why she's dumb. She's not she's really not very intelligent. So, uh, so here's what I think about uh, Kamala. I think some of that is an act. I think really? some of that. Yeah, I do. I, because I've been I've been spending time with that movie The Prestige a lot, and there's some very interesting things about The Prestige that are applicable to um, our world. So we live in this world where there's a lot of sleight of hand, and I think that it's really um, part of the act to make Biden or whoever Biden is look senile and dotty. It's really part of the act to make uh, Kamala Harris. Uh, look like she's just speaking in, you know, word loops. I, I think it's an act. Oh, well, she's a pretty good actress. Well, I think she's got her line. I mean, you don't have to memorize too many lines when it comes to stuff like that. Right? <laughs> so, um, and I'm not saying she's a Nobel Prize winner, uh, but if you go back and you watch her during the debates, and she was always considered like when she, when she was a Senator, she, she, you know, and she would try to dress people down. She was not dumb. 
right? She was not dumb. She was, she may have been strident. Uh, she may have been annoying, but she was not dumb. And even during the debates, she, she wasn't, she, she, she may have been uh, over aggressive, but she wasn't dumb. I, mean, I think she was dumb to sit next to uh, Tulsi Gabbard, but that's another story. Uh, but I don't, I don't think she's as dumb as she's being portrayed now or the role she's taking. Now, some people may say, well, she, that's just a replacement. I think it's part of the act. I think it's part of the act to disarm the American people. Mm -hmm. you know, look at these bumbling, you know, dolty idiots, right? So it also demoralizes people too, but I think it's more of an act. Anyway, that's just my thoughts on it. Well, she got after uh, I have a little note here that after Harris was elected California Attorney General, that's that's amazing. She's elected Attorney General for Mayor what? Newsom of yeah, San Francisco right. appointed Gascon to her post. So that, that's the San Francisco connection. Yeah. yeah. So the whole thing with Harris is really fascinating because she was the DA for Oakland, and that's when she started to hang out with Willie Brown. And through Willie Brown, she gets introduced into San Francisco society. And that's where she starts to make all of her connections, all of her funding, all of her money. And then she she worked for uh, Terrence Hallinan, if I'm not mistaken, who was the DA at the time. And so she ran against him. And man, she turned on him. She really turned on him. And because she turned on him, it was one of the turning points of her election. And that helped her get elected. And once she became the DA of San Francisco, wasn't that hard to become the attorney general for the state, especially with somebody like Willie Brown, who was a political machine. Um, well, her. compared to Gaskin, those are probably the good old days when she was attorney, when she was district attorney. Well, you know, she was. Wasn't was she kind of tough? Oh, she filled the prisons. Yeah, she so that was the that prisons. was a lead up. That was a lead up to a flip over to this other uh, uh, regime. See, that this is a really interesting point you bring up too. Like, there's a period where if you got busted for weed, and it was on Kamala's watch, forget it. You were going, right? You were going to jail. You were going to prison. Let's say you had a couple of ounces. You're going to prison because they wanted to fill those prisons. They were making money off those guys, right? So now it's flipped. Now it's like, well, let's. They don't really. They don't really have any stances. They're just. They're. They're just adjudicating and participating wherever the money and the power is telling them to go. That's it. That's it. Well, the, the other big element of this, too, is I mean, there's, there's actually one thing in addition they did. They ended cash bail for crimes. That's lot, right. They did a lot yeah. of that. So that's equivalent to emptying the prisons. That's right. There, but there are 94 U.S. attorney attorneys spread across the country. So how much damage is that has been done there under the Biden regime? Oh, it's huge. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. You know, probably probably Trump probably held it together a little bit, but I don't even know that Trump is really that alert. Well, I I think to some degree he held it back a little. Um, you know, there there are a number of Trump appointed judges that are floating around. I don't know how good they are, but um, certainly it wasn't, you know, like going down the hill and you know, in Mr. Toad's ride without the brakes, because this is where this is right now. Um, do you want to transition into the Veritas guy? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So let's set the stage here. If you haven't seen the video, uh, Veritas found uh, th this, this character who is fairly high on the food chain for Pfizer. And the setup was that the guy who was working for, for Veritas was, was theoretically on a date with him, right? Isn't that the setup? Yes, it sounds like they went on like three dates. So, so they set up a honey honey pot. So this is a really interesting 
video. It's nine minutes long. And Russ and I decided that we would play the whole thing and stop it along the way and do some commentary. But this is war. I mean, th this is really war when you got an organization like Project Veritas, and I have to hand it to them. Even you know, even though you might kind of question the tactics they use a little bit, it's war. This is war. This is what war looks like. So, here here's the dude right here. Oh, this is after the interview. Okay, right. after, this is after the interviews. But you want to you want to do this first? Yeah, let's just run this because part of the interview is in here, right? So let's do let's do this part. So this is where he's being confronted uh, by James O'Keefe, and um, let's let's just play this. Hey there, is this seat taken? You work for Pfizer. My question for you is, why does Pfizer want to hide from the public the fact that they're mutating? The okay, this is a, when I saw this right here. He gets up, and it's almost like he's a robot. Did you did you catch that? It's, it's you know like the, the first at first I just relished this because like I say this is war and this is inflicting real damage on the enemy and I hate Pfizer, but the second third time I was re looking at this I mean just imagine the shock of this guy you can kind of understand his reaction. He he can you it, imagine he, he knows he's going to be put in front of ten million people. He gets up and he almost assumes like this robot position. Watch him. Yeah. Well, he's, in he's in shock. He's public. The fact that they're mutating the COVID viruses. Is this real life? I'm literally a yeah. liar. What, I was what trying to impress a person on a date What's your by position? lying. Please, this is please, absurd. Please, please don't touch me. Well, this is not, by the way, why don't, are you doing don't this? tell anybody. Just someone who was just working at a company to literally yeah. help the public. Like, you you really did. Please read the cost as soon as possible. It's very, very unsafe. Can you please unlock your door? No, you, no, don't let them leave. Please unlock the door. Give them why is going on here? Stuff. You, please, please unlock. Please unlock the door. Please unlock the door. Unlock the door. The door. The door. We're trying to get. Unlock the door. Unlock the door. Spies are not want the public to know that you guys are doing directed evolution. What, what's going on here? I thought it was like an interview. What are you I'm just, I don't know, it's freaking me out. I mean, these like flashbacks to that like seeing organization of like those conservative people who like randomly go. See, he's not dumb. Yeah, like, he smelled something, but he just he, goes right ahead into the trap. Well, honey, honey trap. That, that's because he probably wants a little action and probably yeah. because he's a little uh full of himself at the same time but he knows he in the back of his mind he's putting some things together here so he's not dumb organizations and then like befriend people who work in these organizations and then report them <laughs> which happened to people at Pfizer so it's like it freaks me out when people start asking a lot of questions about work it's like, oh, really? oh, I'm yeah, sorry. yeah. Well, why are we back on this company because I'm I just want to know the answer <laughs> yep, we recorded you. <laughs> hey there. Is this seat taken? What? Hi. Um, you work for Pfizer. My question for you is why does Pfizer want to hide from the public the oh fact that God. they're mutating yeah, the COVID is. viruses? Is this real life? What is happening here? Why? What is going on here? This is absurd. Why does Pfizer want to hide from the public that they're mutating the COVID virus? Oh my God! You're on video. You're on video. <laughs> mutating what is the COVID going virus. On here? I need to call the police right now. This is. Can I, can I know this is my restaurant. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on either. This is ridiculous. So you're on video. Uh, we're, 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 I'm a journalist. Bro, first of all, I'm literally a yeah. liar. He's he's on video. Whoa. You're saying we're exploring how the virus keeps um, mutating. Yes, One of the things we're exploring right is why don't we mutate the virus? I don't know what's happening. But I really need the cops here right now. So what uh, is this? please do. Please do call the police. Please do call the police. Please do. You can't do this here, guys. Okay. No, you can't do this here. You're going to call the police. He's, he's uh, going to call the police for asking him a question. Please do call the police. Please do. Okay, so what happens? The, the woman who's the owner of the restaurant, 
which is within her rights, by the way. I guess if she's the owner of the manager, she can ask them to leave. It's not a public place. Well, it's kind of disrupting the overall it, restaurant. It's a private place of business, right? So she yeah. has the right to do that. But she also ushers him back into the area where he can make uh, kind of a, a, an uninterrupted phone call to the police, right? So clearly, um, I think she's coming to his aid let's let I'm, she's coming well, to the guys it could aid. be a it could be a watering hole for pfizer employees could be maybe she knows him i don't know um look like a pretty good pizza but um let's uh let's keep going he's uh on tape here talking about mutating the covid virus you, can I talk to you outside about Absolutely this? Absolutely not. You're not even my wife is on this. What is your name? Because you fucked up. You really did. I'm about to sue you. This is absurd. Please. You had someone mock at me as if they're going on a date to record me. You don't even know my position at this. What I was trying to impress position? a person on a date What's your by position? lying. I was literally trying. Okay. I'm not even a scientist by background. You know what that I came from a consulting firm right. that does business. Uh, this please, is please, absurd. Please don't touch me. This is absurd. Please so, call the cops here Please do call the cops. Please do. Why would you call the cops if you have nothing to hide? <laughs> so he's obviously having one of the most outrageous reactions I've ever seen uh, in the history of Project Veritas. He's threatening to call the police. So he's trying to claim. Okay. He grabbed the microphone. The question is, why is he calling the police? What? Can I pay the bill? Can I get a check for the bill? Please? No, do not give me a check. No, no, she wants a check for the bill. <laughs> do you want to put me in jail for asking you a question? Yes, sir. What is the intention of calling the police? They have like no one's digit right now. We have several witnesses. Can I talk to you, please, about this video? Okay, so there's one, two, three, four, five white people. Why would you bring race into this? Please give me the call. Please, please, we have you on tape talking about mutating the COVID virus. No one mutates a COVID virus. Show you the May I show you the video? No, I want to call the police. Do we have to leave? Yes. Okay. Sorry, No, you cannot just leave. Are you? Do you want me to leave? I want the police to come here and see all of you people. Because this is Can I? Can you? Can I ask you about this video? Please. You can tell them about how he's lying to a press. Here, just, just. Is it true what you say? What is this? No. I literally was on a birthday with a guy, and like normal men, you lie to impress a date. Mutating <laughs> viruses? Do you do you do you not work for Pfizer? This guy. I thought he was a date. Do, sir, do you not work for Pfizer? <laughs> okay, that's got to be the line of the year. That's got to be the well, line. Well, I'll tell of you what. Year. I I consider this mutant stuff very real. I think that's what they did. I think they were using aerosols. I I think there's some really Big time crimes are committed by this company. And so for this guy to, even if he's just trying to flirt with his date, you, know, you go, said it, I man. Get... You said it, man. And it got, and the word, now the word is out there and it's a way to present this to the public. This is the and, line of the and year. And the onus is on you, Mr. Walker. I literally was on a third date with a guy and like normal Lying, men, I lie. I lie. To, and just to, so I happen to be lying about, you know, mutant, <laughs> mutant COVID. <laughs> First of all, you're not a normal man. No, he's you know, you're not, and, and normal man. He's, fl he's flaming and hysterical. The normal men do not lie to impress on a date. A normal man it, it does his best to, we all, we look, we all front when we're in front of women. If we're in that stage where we want to impress, I'll use the word women here. Um, but if you front too much, right, like you, you run into, you know, narcissistic territory, and then you set up expectations of being somebody that you can never fulfill, and you don't leave any room for error if you go down that path too far, <laughs> right. right? So most men realize this, and it's like, yeah, I'll show you some of my good stuff. Well, my, my favorite saying is, is Abraham Lincoln once said it says, no man has a good enough memory to be a successful liar. Abraham Lincoln. So right. That was, that's always what I kind of went by. Right. So <laughs> that's the line of the year, though. Like any other man, you lie to impress a date. <laughs> okay. Yeah, ridiculous. This is really this is really something. J Jordan Tristan. <laughs> Jordan Tristan. So we'll call him Trishy. So this this is really interesting. Director Worldwide R&D Strategic Operations 
and mRNA scientific planning. Now, he said something interesting. I wonder if he was lying about this. And he said, I'm not even a scientist. I was hired from a consulting firm. He's a, he's a MD, medical doctor. He says, he says, I come from a marketing background. No, he's, 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 a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, he's a, he's a MD. So Medical I guess he's, school. I guess he's lying at the beginning where he's basically saying, I'm just a nobody that they hired from a, from a uh, consulting agency and in, 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 uh, to use your terminology, uh, I'm just a turtle on the fence post, but maybe that <laughs> uh, this, he, this is very weird. All right, let's keep going. Let's, let's watch, play this out. Why to impress a date? Mutating viruses? Do you, do you, do you not work for Pfizer? This guy, I thought he was a date. Sir, do you not work for Pfizer? Do you no, work for the contractor? What the fuck are you? Do you currently about? work for Pfizer? Yes or no? All right, that's that's the uh, that's the org, right? Let's go back to the org. No. Do you currently this work for Pfizer? Yes or no? What are you talking about here? Please, I want the cops to be here. So you you don't work for Pfizer? Can you, you can't do this. He doesn't want me to leave, ma'am. I tr <laughs> Whoops. Hold on. I, he wants the cops here, but he doesn't want me to leave. So I'm in a little bit of a predicament because she's asking me to leave, but he doesn't want me to leave. So what should we do? The door's locked. <laughs> they locked him in. Okay, so these people have just, I was on a Hi, date. You're on a video and here. These people literally went Look. Out of By the way, uh, legally, by locking him in, that's kidnapping. There's actually a legal code for this, right? So by law, they cannot lock him in and detain him. So they're they're if they if he wanted to, he could he could pursue legal action against both him and the restaurant. All right, let's keep going. No Pfizer is this mutating is the virus. This is absurd. Look at this. No, video. I literally said that. Is, what are you talking about? Well, this is not. By the way, why don't, are you doing don't this? tell this anybody. Someone who is just working at a company to literally help the public. This why do you want to hide it from the public? All right, I can't believe I'm going to trust the one. Why do you want to hide it from the public? If you suspect that, that so mutating place. COVID virus, is this the way the virus started in Wuhan? Why do you think it's okay for Pfizer to do that? She, he's filming the restaurant owner right now. He's filming her. I don't know why he's filming her. Would, would you like me to leave? Because he won't. He's asking me not to leave. And he's consenting to my presence. Ma'am, are we allowed to just stay and ask a few questions? It's pretty remarkable that they call the police on us every time we show up and ask questions. Every time. You say Pfizer is planning on doing research in the future, then claim that there's an ongoing research about that and that there better not be any more outbreaks. Which is it? Are these experiments happening or not? Calling the police. We can do it right up front. Okay. No, do not leave. Do not leave. <laughs> What's that? They locked this in. Wow, look at that. Yeah. You do you want us to leave or not? Ma'am, you locked the door. Ma'am? Ma'am, we're trying to leave, but you locked us in here. Call our attorney. Can you please unlock your door? Let us out. No, I don't know what's going on. I don't want you to leave it before I know what's going on. Can you please unlock your door? No, no, don't let them leave. Can you unlock the door? I still like saying that. No, don't let them out. Don't let them out. Could you please let us leave, ma'am? I don't know what's happening. We'd like to leave. We'd like to leave. Please unlock the door. Like, see, now they're worried because they know what they're doing. No, no. Oh, stop. Get away from me. Please, 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 un please unlock the door. Get him. Why is going on here? Stop. Please, 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 unlock, please unlock the door. Please unlock the door. 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 
This is this is remarkable here. Thank you. Thank you. We're trying to get to unlock the door. Unlock the door. Unlock the door. It's not a unlock the door. It is not. Stop. Let go of me. Now you're hurting me. What is going on here? You cannot just record people like that. Come on. It's not okay. Come on. It's not okay. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. We're we're in New York City. This is remarkable. What you just witnessed here uh, in the restaurant. Come on, guys. Where's the Where's the car? Where's the vehicle? Keep walking. Come on. This is insane. You just witnessed one of the most remarkable interactions ever. Do we have the iPad? So we're getting into the vehicle now. Where's our car? He's charging the guy, charging, charging, charging. You can't make an arrest at this point if you don't have the, the victim right here. Okay. If he was here, you'd arrest that guy? If he was here, yes. Oh, then we could just walk away then. Not worry about it. If that's, if that's what you guys want to do. So, boy. There's a lot. They just ran rings around that poor guy. I mean, at some point, I actually started to feel sorry for him. I could see why. I, I could just see ran why. rings around, and he's just going. He's hysterical. Uh, I don't know, man. It's war. I'm it, sorry. It, 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 this it, is war. You're you're you, you're an employee of Pfizer, uh, who's very much despised by a, a large number of people and growing, and you're mouthing off about this shit whether you whether you're bragging or you know about it you're just open it's open season on you buddy i'm just sorry this is just the way it is so reality one of the things it doesn't come through in that clip but when he's talking to his prospective lover um they start to talk about gain of function and he says well we don't call it that anymore we call it directed evolution, right? So they're, so they're, they're doing this Orwellian language swap, which happens all the time, right? You know, oh, it's directed evolution now. So when somebody brought this up about Fauci. Directed evolution. Directed evolution. Controlling the mutations. Right. So somebody brought this up about Fauci. And when they accused Fauci of gain of function, and he you know, flat out said no. In Fauci's mind, he's probably saying, well, we practice directed evolution. We did not participate in gain of function. Right? So they're playing these semantic games and changing the terminology of things. Um, you know, there's a part, of, there's, there, there's, that, that's a really like hard kind of scene to witness in a lot of ways. But he's, the guy self-inflicted on himself. Yeah, O'Keefe, you know, O'Keefe's crew just kind of just played along and kind of uh, strung him along, but he just, I mean, lost it. But he knows he, he knows damn well who this guy is, and he's going to be seen by millions of people. Can you imagine? I don't. I, I think I'd. I think I'd kind of lose it too. Uh, in, I fact, Don, in fact, I might get. I might be a little more violent than he was. I bet Don Lamont is desperately looking for his number. Let's get him on the show. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, my, again, just my quick takeaway from him is I don't think he's dumb. I think he's actually pretty, pretty bright. Um, hysterical. But he's also, to me, like he just smells like somebody who's been enabled. Yep. Right, like every yep. step of the way, just completely yep. That's enabled. That's a key point. And now all of a sudden, and in over his head, and he's in over his head. Right, and now all of a sudden he just ran into, like the the wall in the Truman Show. Right, that's what happened, and and now the enabling, all the enabling, that he more than likely was relishing and participating in couldn't save him in that moment yeah so, that's a very good point because it's war you just walked into a battlefield and he did he did not know what hit him at all and there's there's a point in there where he says 
hey, I'm human, right? I'm human. So he's talking about his vulnerability and he's talking about his frailty as a human, right? But on the other hand, it's war. What, what about the rest of the humans who've been vulnerable and frail and at the, you know, the barrel end of coercion and pressure to submit to a certain operation that Pfizer and Moderna. Yeah. When he, when he said that, I was reminded of the time here in Prague when I, you know, I'm not vaccinated and they wouldn't let me into restaurants. Right. Right. You and weren't the, human. I, I, you were not human. You were I like was, a dog. Exactly. I was not human. I was just like a, a, like a subhuman. And I have to say, people didn't treat me that way because they're just kind of following orders. Right. And I can remember one restaurant that's, that I used to go to, and the guy recognized him, and he came out, and he was, he was almost crying. He was almost in tears, turning me away. He didn't want to do it. Right. He says, sorry, he says, sorry sir. He used the word sir. I, I have to. I can't let you in. And he, and he was, kind of looked down and kind of averted away. It looked like he was tearing up. Right. 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 Yeah. So take that, you know, it's good. The payback is hell. Paybacks are hell. And I, you, I, I have to, I'll have to say a certain Freud and all this. There, you know, there was a time when it was considered um, unclean to let dogs in restaurants, by the way, I'm not a big dog and restaurant person. Um, I think dogs could be dogs and unvaccinated. You know, it's like, yeah, if you have a dog, you want to put them on the patio or whatever, that's fine. But this whole thing with dogs and restaurants, I'm, I don't really, and I love dogs too. But back in the day when dogs weren't allowed in restaurants, you know, you were, you were, you were treated like a dog. That's, that's what you were treated like, you know, so, so much for being human, right? You know, very yeah, interesting. Meanwhile Meanwhile, the streets are empty. You know, the restaurants are not getting anywhere near the business they usually get because there's holdouts. Everybody's kind of hold, you know, hold up. And that's it's that's wrecking the economy. I, you know, I, I think the economies of all these countries, whether it's the Czech Republic, United States, have really been da badly damaged by these oh, yeah. assholes. Absolutely. So no, I don't. I feel a little sympathy for the guy's humanness, and I kind of wouldn't want to be in his shoes. And, uh, you know, maybe he's kind of like down the, the, the ladder a little bit is really the not, guy. Not too much. On. Not too much. I mean, he was maybe one or two tiers down from Borla, right? That's, uh, he's pretty close to the top. Enabled. So he's a, but he could just be like a token hire. He, well, look, he checks all the ESG boxes, doesn't he? Yeah. Right. So exactly. he, so he's. Oh man, what a stereotype! Oh, this is incredible. I mean, <laughs> it really it, is it, incredible. It looks like looks like he's mixed. Um, he he's clearly gay, right? right? So so you know, it's like, yeah, we just checked that ESG box. We're we're safe. Um, let me ask you a question about this. What would happen? And I don't think this is too far out of the realm of possibility. Certainly, I'm not wishing it. But what would happen if this guy committed suicide? Yeah, well, it's war. Boy, this think is war. Think about what would happen. Or what if they said, hey, look, we're gonna you're gonna fake your death. You're yeah, gonna fake turned, your death. Then they did the victimhood card and make it right. uh, you know right. flip that on right. So Project this is Veritas. this is a right. really precarious moment with this dude. Very precarious. Uh they could, you know, and these social engineers, man, they could just move. The energy, yeah. any way, any way they want to move it, right? So, um, very. That's a very interesting video to see. Uh, probably the most, and they've had some good ones, but that one was a uh, whole other level, whole other level. Um, I think we have some time to to maybe wrap this up with some Jacques Attali. You want to just look at this video that I got queued up here? Yeah. All right. So the last time Russ was on, uh, we had talked about um, Jacques Attali, uh, and he's one of these guys that kind of flies under the radar when it comes to like these social engineers. And he has written uh, a number of books 
and provided a number of materials where essentially um, what you're seeing is, is he prophetic or is he writing the script? That's the level that uh, Jacques Attali is at. So let's uh, do a quick wiki. Now, for, now, one of the reasons I might add that that people may not be too familiar with him is that he mostly speaks in French. Right. Most of his speeches, I found a couple speeches of his in English. They weren't that good. He, I thought he was kind of an empty suit. He speaks English adequately, but his writings and so he's, he's not really maybe that well known in the English speaking world. So um, these are the books that uh, he's known for. Uh, Noise, the Political Economy of Music, Labyrinth in Culture, Soci Culture and Society, Pathways to Wisdom, and a Brief History of the Future. This is the one. The Brief History of the Future is the biggie. That's, that's right. The biggie. Speculative Technology, a book about the next 50 years. So yeah, that's he, the revealing one. So he was born in Algeria. He's got a twin brother, uh, Bernard Atali. He's Jewish. Jewish family. Father, Simon Atali, self-educated. Uh, success in perfumery, uh, married uh, Fernand uh, Ab Abacassis on 27 January 1943. Uh, his mother gave birth to his sister, uh, Fabienne. So they're part of the whole Algerian independence thing. You know, France has this war with Algeria. And then, of course, now you have this Algerian diaspora where they go to France, right? So that's how he winds up in, in France. So he goes to school at the Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, first of the class in 1963, graduates from Ecole des Mines Sciences, Po and Ecole Nationale de Administration. He's third in his class. So clearly he's a bright dude. Uh, he does an internship at the Prefecture of French Department. Uh, so he's got this connection with Francois Mitterrand. So throughout his career, he becomes like an advisor to the state. You know, he's, he's the and, and Mitterrand was a socialist. And he shows up again with Sarkozy. He he is like um, you know one of the court advisors, right? This is this is his real this is his function. Uh, he's also a professor. He teaches in economics. Uh, this is where he is uh, chief of staff for Mitterrand. So this guy is deeply deeply embedded in French politics, French political structure. Um, he's a, a futurist, a theorist. And he is very much connected to the whole idea of climate change and the World Economic Forum. Uh, so now he's the, he's he's the guy who's credited with having spotted Macron, right? So mm. Atali has supported uh, supported uh, Radicals. Uh, uh, talk about turtles on the fence post. He is often credited with having spotted Macron and enabling him to become president of the French Republic. Think about that sentence. Turtles on the fence post. Enabling yeah. him. There's that word again, enabling, but that's a lot of power. That is a lot of power. So he was also an investment banker at Rothschild and Company. And then interest uh then <laughs> to Francois. <laughs> There's a key one right there. So this guy is a big time globalist. And big tied time. The, okay, so he's tied into the Rothschilds and he's a kingmaker. Uh, turtle on the pence post kind of guy. He and he has his he has his feet in economy, money, social economy, and technology. So th this this is his background. This is his um, you know these 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 are his areas of expertise. Right. He's got a whole private financial career. He's also connected to the music and the arts. So he comes off as being a bit of a Renaissance man, um, Commission right. for the Liberation of French Growth, known as the Atali Commission. You know, this guy is really, really embedded, really embedded. Um, so I found this interview with him, and he's talking about the future, and he's and he's talking about the the book that uh, we mentioned here, and it's called A Positive Future. And it's about a 10 minute video. And I, and I think it's worth playing because he says some things in this video that are familiar to a lot of people, but then he says some other things 
that are part of the subtext, which should really grab your attention because these are the guys that are mapping out the technocratic future. So let's pl let's play this. And uh, his English is pretty reasonable in this interview. Uh, let me introduce Jacques Attadi, uh, who will join me, who's president of the Positive Planet um, Foundation in Paris. Jacques Attali, welcome. Uh so real quick, Russ, I just got to jump in here real fast. It's another case of word magic, right? Positive planet, like positive for who? <laughs> positive for who? A few, negative for a lot of the planet. And so notice that they, are, they continue to use the term initiative. That's a common a kleptocratic, plutocratic term, as is foundation. So just repeat, wash, rinse, repeat. Here we go. Nice handshake. Jacques, you've been sitting behind listening to the discussion for the last hour and a quarter. Is this a positive future that you can hear well, uh, emerging? There are many things that have been said very interesting and demonstrate that a lot of positive things are happening. But what I call positive doesn't mean that it's optimistic. What I call positive means that it's possible to succeed. There are a lot of potential trumps for the future. Positive means to be uh, useful for next generations. And the question we should have in mind is, what, do what we do useful for next generation, for people which are six years old or not even born? It's not always true. Uh, I would say that if we were doing what was good for next generations 20 years ago, the world would be better today. Uh, let's take an example, California. We, a lot of people here are coming from California. If 20 years before, uh, people have done in California what was good for climate change, for water protection, for electricity, for bridge, for whatever, California. Okay, so I got to stop that right there. So Gavin Newsom uh, and his predecessors have been at war with the farmers in Central California, and they've been draining the water so that they can protect a very minor species of salmon and another fish. So when he brings something like that up, like, well, they've got a water crisis. Yeah, they created the water crisis, right? Yeah, they created weapon, weapon, He's the weaponizer. So, so this is what they do, right? Problem, reaction, solution, right? Now we're coming along. We got the solution because we know what the problem is. And if they just done this decades ago, they wouldn't be experiencing this now. I, I, some, I just have to interject every now and then. I will not be in the terrible stage as it is today. Therefore, it's very important for the benefit of people living today to take care of next generation. And I hope we will not make the, main mis the same mistakes worldwide uh, today for the people living in 20 years. What is futurology? Is it astrology with a different title? I mean, I say that <laughs> rather facetiously because... No, you're right. You're right. Because anyone can guess. You, you know, I don't know why this guy who's interviewing, except that he's a stuffed suit, didn't follow him and say, well, what mistakes are you referring to, Jacques? Right? Yeah, he just, glosses, he just yeah. glosses right over it and says, well, let's talk about futurology. Well, what he, what he does is he says something that is kind of dear to my heart, you know, future generations. I kind of, I really agree with that. But what does that mean? Exactly. Right. There's more. There's another one that I. So they, get, they have, he has the platitudes. Right. And he's going to, he's going to talk about freedom here and I'm going to stop it when he gets to freedom. And I'm going to we'll have a little discussion about that. It's about the future. Well, there are very few things that are certain. Demography is almost certain. And people should not forget that in 30 years from now, there will be 2.5 billion people in Africa and will change everything. That at the end of the 21st century, we more than 4 billion people. That's in big, Africa, by the way. Which has changed everything. Again, that's if really? that's a number, if that's a number. 2.5 billion. Oh, uh, man, it's, it's the birth rates in Africa are amazing. And that is for certain. The big issue. The other thing that are almost certain is that we know what kind of new waves of technology is coming. We were talking about uh, augmented or artificial intelligence. I prefer also augmented. Art. But there are other technologies that are coming. But we know that are far, not far from being useful. Genetics, 
uh, everything which is linked to biotechnology, prothesis, but also something which is not very well addressed. Stop, stop here for I a second. I spend a lot of time myself. To Robert, stop for a second. Okay, so he's, he's, he's associated with Sarkozy. And what does Sarkozy do? I mean, th what he said about Africa is really true. But Sarkozy is instrumental in letting the floodgate from Africa come into Europe. That's right. Yep. So what did you do about that? You know, what well, he, did won't, he won't address you're that. Guilty. You're guilty. Yeah. You're part of a guilty party of taking the, a stable country, Libya, which was working to stabilize uh, Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, and to kind of keep the, the populations intact, keep them from spilling into Europe. And you remove that. So you're guilty. Right. The other thing, which is mind blowing, is that um, Africa as a continent uh, was really not vaccinated. Like they weren't vaccinated during COVID and they had the lowest rate theoretically of COVID, which is kind of interesting. Um, so let's hear, we'll keep, but you're absolutely right about that. Understand and to work on it, which is biomimics. Bio. Biomimics, which is a fact of imitating the nature to develop new technology. This is a huge wave of change that will totally overthrow what is uh, fashionable today. Which so basically what he's saying, this is the Luciferic angle, right? That they are going to create technologies that mimic nature, that they're going to remake the world, right? They're going to remake the natural world through the application of technology. That's the subtext with biomimics. Which is AI. What will be fashionable in this place in five or six years will be biomimics. I take a bet with you. And when I see other waves of technology, and if you develop that, you, you can see what kind of future. Of course, many things are uncertain. Um, are we going to address the uh, climate change? Are we going to address the uh, social inequalities? Are we going to address the global governance, which is needed? Are we going to stay uh, in a world, uh, if we're going to take a metaphor of the world today, is like a plane? Global governance, which is needed, right? That's a yeah, big- it's, it's, But it's Janus, it's two-faced Janus. Yeah. Very two-faced Janus, because he's, ver he's very good at kind of articulating some of the challenges. But with many classes for passengers, but, uh, but no then pilot, he brings uh, uh, no the wing. wrong thing to bear. <laughs> so he's two faced. Therefore, it's clearly uh, something has to, to be done. If it's not done, uh, then uh, the world will be uh, quite challenging. But we can say a lot about the future technology, demography, and also the fact that whatever uh, changes are coming, people are looking for freedom. Freedom. What do you mean by freedom, though? They want to be free to do whatever they want. They want to be free to uh, make their choice. And I think. Oh, really? Well, I, I want to be Just free. Nomads. To... Yeah, like me. I want to be free to <laughs> free to own a gun and, and eat a steak. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. That is that is not the freedom that's going well, to I be. I think he's allu also alluding to the ability to just go over borders and park themselves anywhere they want and live anywhere in the world they want. Right. Or or in the most negative sense to do as thou will, right? Oh, I want to, you know, I want to identify as a purple platypus. Oh, yeah, okay, you're free to do that. All right, uh, that's slippery slope here. Let's keep going. I think they want also to be free, but their grandchildren are free. But their grandchildren have a choice by education, by health, by uh, uh, good governance to have their life uh, chosen. If, if you take these... That to me, that's just mind blowing. That's mind blowing. Well, it's counterintuitive because to have good governance, you have to have a government that I think is contained to working with a certain group of people within a confined area, not some world government. It's yeah, nonsense. Good, yeah, good governance is about as little governance as possible. Yeah, what, but how can you have good governance from some, uh, I don't know, wherever they're planning to have their capital, Jerusalem or whatever? Yeah, I yeah, yeah, global standards, man. Setting the global standards for what good governance, and they want their children to be able to have a choice. I'm sure their grandchildren. I'm sure they do, but do these guys want their grandchildren to have a choice? If the choices are laid out by them, 
Of course. Well, here's your choice. Here's your freedom to choose. You got about four or five choices to choose from. They'll give you the choices to make, they'll give you the freedom to make those choices. And if you told, if, if you had a conversation with him, that's what it would funnel into. That's where the good governance would come into play. You know, we filtered out all the bad choices you can make. Yeah. Yep. Here, here we go. Basics, uh, technology, uh, what I call selfish altruism, the fact of looking for the good future of your grandchildren, you have a good views of what the future can be. Do you think we as humans can handle the quality and the, the scale of change that we're now facing? Let's call it disruption as well. This assumption at the moment that actually life is still going to be pretty good. And we began to hear that a little bit in the first session today. But there you had leading, um, leading figures in business saying things are getting difficult now. And will we be able to handle this? First, it depends on where you are. If you are in India or if you are in Africa, you have a more optimistic view of the future because you know that it's difficult to be worse than it is. Second, uh, it has always been very uh, challenging. Look at the change at the beginning of the 20th century when we see happening, uh, arriving cars, electricity, planes, radio, everything which changed our lives more than even what is changing today, then we are not the only generation to see overwhelming changes. But here we have a title of positive future. Yes. Which suggests there's a negative future. Do you think that the danger at the moment is that many people, most people, expect a degree of perfection or life is always going to get better and become more positive? Negative future means future when you only take care of yourself today. In my view, negative means selfishness, narcissism, autism, uh, looking at short term <laughs> for politicians. Negative is autism. I'm sure there's some autistic people uh, in the world that may have a little bit of an issue with that. But, you know, he's basically saying that the negative application of the future is the individual. Yeah, he's, what, he's, that, he's pushing communitarianism. Yes, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Um, that there's this, you know, there's a much higher and evolved value to move beyond your own individual needs. And looking at polls for her CEOs, looking at uh, their uh, share values for next second, that's negative. Positive means when you take care of long term. For instance, I do believe that what is important today is to focus more on investing in infrastructure and infrastructure which have a social impact. If you look at infrastructure with social impact, you make always good decisions. So I could be wrong, but I think what he's saying here is that the infrastructure that they create will not just be a bridge between, you know, two points, but the bridge will have some kind of context within the infrastructure. Like, the infrastructure, the, the new paradigm will be embedded into the infrastructure itself. This is what he's saying. So a bridge. Yeah, because in his, in his book, he talks a lot about surveillance. He talks about a lot of stuff like that. That's, that's, that's embedded into it too. That's right. That's right. So, and, and the infrastructure is digital, current, you know, digital money, all this kind of stuff. Exactly. Exactly. So when he says infrastructure, it is not separate from the ideas that they're embedding in, um, you know, their, their uh, nightmare wet dream. All right, let's keep going. And I think this is the condition, the prerequisite for a positive future. But there we heard Redelio this morning as an investor saying he is deeply concerned about what we can call the hollowing out of the middle of, of, of a community, the um, in greater inequality, the wealth gap widening, is this something which is going to be difficult for those who expect a degree of positive future to have? Yes, it is. Uh, as we are a global economy and we don't have a global government, we don't have global transfers. And therefore, without global transfers, we don't have a global way to reduce inequalities. Therefore, I don't think that we'll have to have a global government before maybe one century. One day it will happen. Before that, in, in, in due course, we have to take care of that. But it's clear that one of the most important gender is the wiping out, wipe out of the middle class. Did you hear that? Yeah. He, he's just putting it right out there. We got to wipe out the middle class. That th this is, 
this is the attack plan. We're going to wipe out the middle class. And, yeah, and it's no coincidence he wrote another book about the Warburg family, banking family. Yeah, yeah. That I haven't read. I was reading ex ex excerpts from it, and I was reading reviews of it. But the bottom line is that he just loves this. He just thinks these banksters are the greatest people that ever lived. Right. So his value system is very, very strange. It's it's Trotskyite. It's kind of right, you know, representing these moneyed, hyper wealthy, Roth, you know, this Rothschild. Group. Yeah, they're they're robber baron oligarchs, right? I mean, that, that's yeah, absolutely. So now then he says something on the back end of this about the middle class. And after he says that, I want to stop and comment on what I think he's saying. It is always a danger for all societies. Do you think that's a real possibility? Yes, it is happening. I very often take the example of a pen. Look at the pens. You have a very uh, expensive pens and you have a very cheap pen, such as this one. But look at the pen in between have disappeared. Then that means, and if you can take this metaphor, that means that um, the pen in between is the middle class. But let me put to you what? the part of our <laughs> project. What? Yeah. <laughs> There's no, Jacques, there's no... you know, up, up, Jacques, up to now, I kind of thought you were brilliant, but now I'm not so sure. You're kind of slipping, man. <laughs> there's, no, there's no pen in between. In fact, <laughs> this is not even the pen. You think Magic. it is a pen, but it is not the pen. Okay. All right. We put this to many people who are in the middle class, who are, have jobs which are traditionally middle class. Yes. They oh. simply can't believe the kind of thing you've just said. They can't conceive of the fact that what they've taken for granted and assumed will be there is not guaranteed anymore. Of course, it's very important to awake people and to awake <laughs> ourselves. Everything is a challenge. Is, that, that is the question of boiling frog. We oh don't my know God, this guy's sinister. Frog is not boiling. And we have to understand for ourselves that nothing is certain. There is a potential, amazing potential future, positive future. But we have to take care of it. And in the middle class, you are mentioning what is fundamental is education, 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 all along the life. So what he's really saying is re-education, re-education, re-education. Yes, you're going to lose whatever toehold you or your parents or your parents' parents have worked on. And that's why we have all these attack points that we've been discussing all evening coming at you, whether right. it's emptying the jails, whether it's... Uh, uh, ruining your education system. The, the more you're educated about your forced austerity and realize that it's for the greater good, you'll be fine. That's what he's saying. Yeah, I think so. Lifelong learning. Lifelong learning. Find new initiatives, create new ideas. Never consider whatever you have is, is forever. Life is not forever. Life can What, what the hell? Can, come on. Come on, man. Uh, Social status can. What about traditional crafts? Fact, what about just learning something at a young age, being a mechanic? Being... You know, just what, what oh, are you no, the hell no, are you no, even no, talking no, about? No, 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 no. Those are outdated ideas. Come on now, those are outmoded, outdated ideas. Traditional, not, Tradi they're, they're traditional. They're not fit for education. the twenty first century, right? Exactly. All right, we got a couple of minutes left. Let's play this out because okay. um, I got a few other things to say about it very bleak about the ability of business to cope with all of this. But he did make a point, which I think your work has mentioned and our work has certainly mentioned, this very serious problem of where are the leaders of the future going to come from to handle this? You've worked in government, yeah. you've worked in institutions. I work in government and now I've created a Positive Planet Foundation. We help governments, we help cities, we help companies to organize this transition toward a positive future by I helping bet. people to reorganize, reoriented their companies, and it works. We I'll bet you are. Governments and companies. And what tips them over to from being negative, cautious, to actually being positive, even if the realities are really quite significant and forbidding? To be proud in the eyes of their grandchildren. Say that again. To be proud in the eyes of their grandchildren. Grandchildren have What does that even role. mean, Jacques? Come what, on, what you're just pulling it out of your ass. Certainly is chief executives are always talking about their grandchildren and their children and the impact that that has on them. That's a big change, isn't That's it? That's a big change. Final thought. If we were having this discussion in five years, hopefully we will, what do you think you might be saying about what we should have been saying tonight? <laughs> I, I hope that what we have said to tonight was a program for the next five years and that we'll have succeeded. <laughs> Jacques Attali, merci bien. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. So this gets back to one of the things that you and I were talking about earlier on. Uh, and it gets into the discussion about Plutarco in Mexico and the Jacobins, the Montagnards in France. There's never any talk about God. There's never any talk about faith. It's not, there's not one mention about that subject or topic with Jacques Attali. None. Our future has nothing to do with any of that. It's just a vague reference to your grandchildren, as if though he knows what the grandchildren, what, what's going to make them happy. Yeah, he does, exactly. And the guy doesn't have any clue because he just pulls it out of his ass, for want of a better word. So one of the things you and I were talking about is that this is a clear example of a Luciferian. That is a Luciferian. Like, just bringing, you know, stealing fire from the gods and technology and you know, re recreating nature with biomimicry. That's exactly what these and guys And using are a lot about. of Janus language. Yeah. Faced. Yeah. Yeah. So he's got pla he's got platitudes that he, he addresses important platitudes that do, do need addressing. Yeah, subjects that do need addressing, but he's got the he's got those uh plastic platitudes. I call them plastic platitudes because they're they're stretchy and elastic, but there's nothing to them, really. Yep. They're good yeah, yeah. He guys really is kind of an empty suit. That's kind of what I saw in another speech of his. It just I, I wasn't that impressed. I don't know quite understand. Well, what the I don't think you're is. supposed to be impressed at that level, right? I think if you sat down with him in uh, a a dark room, um, and you had access to whatever is going on behind the firewall with him, he would tell you exactly where this is going you know so we get the kind of tepid watered down version for the public's consumption but i don't think that's what's really going on right back here that's my sense these guys are a lot of show and tell right they're showing but they're not telling a lot you know that's 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 what i think i think it's kind of back to the harris conversation in the biden conversation you know we got the village idiot and the babbling brook and you know is that really what's going on or is that just for show and public consumption? I think there's a lot of show and public consumption going on. Um, well, Russ, we covered a lot of ground today. Yeah. We didn't think we were going to get through it. Did we, but we did. <laughs> no, no, I really, I thought, I thought this was a really good show. Yeah. I, I thought we, we, uh, and I think we managed to connect a lot of dots together because even if we wanted to, right. Like if we go back to, to Tristan, you know, he, he's a perfect candidate for Jacques Altelli's new world. Like, that's his guy. That's who he's speaking to in a lot of ways. So, anyway, um, we'll have you back on in a month, and I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about by then. And it's really great that uh, you're on the mend and feeling a lot better. We'll see you soon. We'll see you soon as I'm noticing these months go by pretty fast. Yeah. Do you, you have any other shows you'll be on? Uh, no, I'm not. I, nothing's really scheduled. Okay. I did a show with Giuseppe that might be worth for people to go listen to. It's pretty, uh, pretty blunt about the black and white situation. Okay. Uh, I'm I I, I getting tired of it, and I thought it, some things needed to be said. Well, I, I did the same thing last. I, it was last week. I had a, I did a show. I did 90 minutes, um, and I went into a deep dive on the topic, and uh, I felt it was it was just one of those kind of, you know, four alarm fires in my head at about 4 a.m. And I'm like, I I gotta I gotta talk about this because it's not good. It's really, really not good. And luckily, um, we're not alone. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, there are a number of men and some women too uh, in the so-called black community who are waking up and they're real, they're realizing that this is not uh, a, a really good future for anybody. So um, if you think it's just a, a predominantly, uh, race-based issue. Uh, it's a human-based issue. 
It's a human based issue. And one of the things that I try to convey is that, you know, let's say, for instance, let's say, for instance, there's a, a major race riot, or let's say, for instance, they um, use uh, what's 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 the word I'm looking for they 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 use like social functions in order to change the social order right there's no there's no guarantee that the people that were able to benefit from those things will be able to benefit from those things moving forward into the future right because there's the very good chance that their positions at the quote of the you know quote, top of the social ladder are tenuous. They're tenuous, right? It's like, yeah, thanks for playing. Thanks for thanks for wiping out the competition. Okay, we, we don't really need you anymore. You were, yeah. you, right? Yeah, and this yeah. is one of the things that people who are kind of on the border of like, man, I'm really angry. Now that, that's what the red, the red uh, Vanguard does. It kind of eats its bit. It's eats, it eats its own. Absolutely. A absolutely. And I remember one time I posted something on YouTube and there was a guy who responded uh, to my uh, video and I, and I, and I think he was black and he said, he said something about, Oh, well, too bad. You won't have baseball and hot dogs and all these other things. You know, like he was being sarcastic and I said, okay, well, you better, you better watch out what you wish for, because if, you know, if, if, you know, if this dynamic changes, you're going to have to deal with the Chinese and <laughs> the, the Chinese do not have the same patience or tolerance. And there are records uh, and I've looked this up. There are records in the past where the Chinese in China have had slaves. And you know what they did to the male slaves? They castrated them. They're like, yeah, we're good. We're good for a generation of service, right? Just remember that, you know? So whatever you wish upon, you know, a certain group or a certain system, you get to deal with what's coming after that. And with what's coming after that, they'll, in fact, Bezmanov even said it, right? He said, the first people we take out after a revolution are the ones that were the most uh, loyal to us because what's coming is nothing compared to what they thought they were involved with. So that I'll, I'll leave it there with that because that's, yeah. re that's really the case. Yep. Yep. That's it. Yeah. All right, Russ. Always great. Thanks. Have okay. a great weekend. We'll see you in a month. All right. See ya. Bye-bye. That was a great what Russ winner. And um, another show in the books here on the Friday forecast. And, and I just kind of want to put a bow on what I just said, because, you, you know, I, I do believe in diversity, but not the same model of diversity that's being pushed on us. And I've talked about this before. I grew up in San Jose, California during the 1970s. And it was, it was integrated. You know, I didn't have to get bust anywhere. Nobody to get bust into my neighborhood. It was integrated. And, you know, the, the, the social fabric was, there, there, there was really very little division. You know, we, 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 you know, we'd go to each other's parties, we'd hang out, you know, sometimes people would hang exclusively with their own group. And sometimes like, you know, Hey, we're here together, you know, let's party, let's play basketball. Was it always kumbaya? No, it wasn't always kumbaya, but it, you know what? We got along and we hung out. And to me, that was an organic diversity. It was just an organic diversity. It's just, it's just the way it was, right? It, it didn't have to be mandated. And now we're on the other side of that story, and it's not a very good story. 
So when I, when I think of diversity, I'm just drawing from my own experience growing up and there are no issues. You can be Brown, you can be black, you can be Filipino, you can be Japanese, you can be Portuguese, you know, as a, by the time I got into my junior year in high school, Korean families started to show up, Persian families started to show up and you're just here. Who are you? What are you about? Right. That's what it was about. So now we have the flip side and we have the weaponized version of diversity, which is not very diverse ultimately. So you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm pulling for people of all stripes, all colors to wake up and to wake up to be manipulated and set against one another. And being told uh, a toxic, absolutely toxic fairy tale about one another. And to me, this is really the true awakening. This is the Aquarian age that they are trying in their very best efforts to deter. Because they have a different version of it. And a version that is simulated, artificial. So I hope that sets the record straight here, and you know, and yeah, and I and I do, you know, I care. I've always cared about the underdog. You know, I've always championed the underdog, and I think in a lot of ways that was an American story. You always pulled for the Cinderella story in the NC two A tournaments. You know, who didn't love the 69 Mets from nowhere to world champions? You know, we love stories like that. We love stories where people all of a sudden, you know, overcome adversity, true adversity. And then they, they tap into their God-given gifts and power, and they're able to put it all together. We love that, right? We love that. We love that story. And it, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter really in some ways who the underdog is. But now I find it very ironic that the underdog that I'm pulling for ultimately are people that look like me. It's weird. I got to say it's weird. It's a very weird thing to think of people that theoretically look like me in this earth suit are the underdogs and society will tell you otherwise society will, will, will bang it into your brain that that is not true. And the word in the streets and the, and the, and the video and the receipts are in are telling a different story. So it's just really weird to take that position. And yet I'm taking it. And it doesn't matter who the underdog is. I'll take that position. When I say underdog, I'm not talking about a synthetic simulated underdog. Tristan at the restaurant would like to think he's an underdog, but he's not. He's not. Anyway, thanks for being here. Um, we'll be back on Sunday night, Sunday night Astro Live on the 11th house. Check out winnerwatch.net if you got any ideas for articles you heard russ he'll be open to them he may edit them but uh it's a chance for you to uh, contribute to a, a, a very well-traveled website and if you have something to say you you could put it out there okay all right for me and jasper use your head in order to discern what's real your heart to say what's possible